longest day of the year, the summer solstice. 4.30 in the morning, and I'm standing in this field with 20,000 hippies, and we're all waiting for the sun to come up. Now, it's a big day, the longest day of the year, the sort of day that needs to be commemorated properly with a sculpture, something huge, monumental and appropriate which is exactly what we've got here. This is a film about a magnificent job share between nature and us. A job share that's resulted in some of the world's mightiest and most intriguing bits of sculpture. All over the world, people and nature have got together to make remarkable things. Why are they doing it? Hmm, an excellent question. Most of the goodies you need to make sculpture, stone, wood, water, clay, the sun, are plentiful in nature. And these are fantastic raw materials, sturdy, adaptable, but they're not always in exactly the right place or quite the right shape. And that's where we come in. We turn up at places like this, look around, quite like what we see, but think we can do better. Because that's us for you, always trying to improve on the handiwork of our gods. In the 60s, a new art movement appeared in American art, called land art. Its ambition was to get people out of the art galleries and to send them careering through the landscape looking for sculpture. Land artists did their stuff in places that were difficult to get to. Getting there was part of the fun. And the harder it was to get there, the more you appreciated what you saw when you reached the end of the journey. Providing, of course, you could actually find the damn thing. Excuse me? Hello? Yes. Uh, I wonder if you could help me. Uh, hi. We're looking for um, Spiral Jetty. Spiral Jetty? Yeah, we're told that you know the way. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I do. <laughs> yeah, Actually, which way is it? just cut out here and turn right. First fork, you're gonna make a left. First second, fork left, yeah. Second fork, make a right. Second fork, make a right. Yeah. Thank you very much, miss. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The most famous of all examples of land art was created on the edge of the Great Salt Lake in Utah by a chap called Robert Smithson. Its name is the Spiral Jetty, a giant kiss curl of stone pushed out into the salty waters. I'm gagging to see it, but I'm not sure if it's still there. Smithson made the Spiral Jetty in 1970. What he didn't know at the time was that the water levels of the Great Salt Lake were at a historic low. There'd been a big drought. So he built the spiral jetty and it was visible for a couple of years. And then the water levels of the Great Salt Lake rose again and it disappeared completely. As far as anyone knew, forever. A 
For 30 years, Spiral Jetty was underwater, gone, disappeared. But just recently, it's been bone dry around here again, and people say the jetty is back. And nature has just been toying with us. Smithson liked reading lots of sci-fi. J.G. Ballard was a particular favourite. Like Ballard, he was obsessed with this idea of entropy, of worlds degenerating and dying. And that is what brought him here. To this mad Max landscape of broken nature, littered with the grubby remnants of post-industrial human junk. The Great Salt Lake is the second deadest stretch of water after the Dead Sea itself. Nothing lives in there except this brave little red shrimp, the brine shrimp, millions and millions of them, which, if the light is right, make the lake look as if it's awash with blood. Smithson liked that. It was the chief reason he chose this place. Voila, the spiral jetty. It's actually made of black basalt collected on the shore. A local construction company built it in a week for just $9,000. The world's most famous bit of land art. In your typical book of symbols, the spiral gets lots of pages to itself. It's a very popular and adaptable symbol. You can read it as a snail, the cosmos, a star system, an endless beginning that's also an end. But I'm inclined to see it more literally than that. As a sci-fi fan, Smithson clearly had an apocalyptic bent. And this swirling stone whirlpool, situated in the middle of the second deadest sea in the world, can perhaps be seen as an atrophied slurp. The kind of shape you get when you pull the chain and everything goes down the pan. When Smithson built this, all these rocks were black as coal. So when it came up out of the water again, white as the driven snow, it had a completely different effect. Hell has become Lapland. Actually walking along it is a very strange feeling indeed. Look at the red. It really does look as if 300 Spartans have had their throats slit in it. Ah, that's spooky. It's halfway between some kind of weird moonscape and this totally natural place. Awesome. It's really awesome. <laughs> I'm nearly there. You know, People sometimes wonder what art is for. It's for this feeling. This makes you want to go, ah! Robert Smithson isn't the only sculptor who's felt the urge to trace giant spirals in the landscape. It's an internationally popular need with a very long history.
The ancient Peruvians, who scrawled this super spiral in the sand, treated the whole of this huge desert plateau like a giant drawing pad. Look, a spider. And here's a hand. And a very elegant hummingbird. Crisscrossed with lines, doodles, faces and squiggles, Nazca, in southern Peru, is a prehistoric flick book of ancient land art. The Nazca lines, as they're called, were only discovered in the 1920s, when passengers on the first commercial air flights to go across here looked out of their windows and saw these. Most of them are so big, you can't really make any sense at all of them from the ground. To see them properly, you have to go up there. things is geoglyphs, giant drawings in the landscape. And this is the biggest and most numerous group of them in the world. And they're located here for a very specific reason. This desert, the Nazca Plain, is one of the driest places on Earth. Just 20 minutes of rain a year. And it gets almost no wind. So when you draw something in this desert, it stays drawn. In this case, for perhaps as long as a couple of thousand years. We don't know much about the Nazca people. Their empire lasted about a thousand years and was wiped out by earthquakes in 1500 and something. But, of course, when we humans know nothing about something, it inspires us to speculate ever more feverishly on the subject. The Nazca lines have had a particularly creative going over from the conspiracy theorists. In 1968, a book came out by Eric von Daniken called The Chariots of the Gods. I read it a few years later. Von Daniken's theory, if I can call it that, is that these constituted an intergalactic landing strip. A bunch of aliens turned up on Earth and built them so they could land their spaceships properly in this desert. Unfortunately, the soil turned out to be unsuitable, so they abandoned their unfinished airport and set off for another planet. Taught to draw in the sand by the aliens, the abandoned locals set about trying to persuade their departed sky guards to return by drawing tempting pictures for them, secret invitations and incantations sprinkled about the Nazca Desert. That's the pottiest theory, anyway. There are many others. Hello? Nazca, alas, has become a giant magnet for the international eccentric. Hello, hello. Ah, <laughs> Victoria Nikitsky. Valdemar <laughs> yes. Ushak from London. I've come to find out about the Nazca lines. Oh, very interesting. And you're the person I hear <laughs> who's going to tell me everything about it. OK. Yeah? <laughs> OK, so this is the entire Nazca lines... Yes, almost. ..in diagrammatic form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I recognise the tower. I I've come here because I've read so many theories about what the lines are for. Mm -hmm. um, alien landing strips? We don't believe that, do we? <laughs> Astronomical calendar? A mm -hmm. little bit more likely? Yeah. 
What's your opinion, Victoria? You've studied them for so many years. Well, now we have new studies that the lines indicate underground water. Because now it's internet every corner, but there's no water in Nazca. And ancient, they knew exactly where the water was. Marvelous. So the straight lines, straight lines, they will indicate we're exactly on a vein of water under us. Trapezoids, like this, this is a trapezoid, trapezoid, this one. This also indicates water in the upper part, a bit upper part, that's water there. So it's a kind of grand plan for life for the Nazca people, everything they need to really to know about here. Yeah, it's like a book. The book of life. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So Victoria wants to show us a place that's very significant for some of her ideas about the water channels. Yeah. Beautiful place. Yeah. Wow. Look at this. And here we can see one triangle. No? Like this? Triangle. Yeah. And it points, it's not straight, a bit curved. Why? Because there's a fault, a fracture there in the mountain. For a fault. Indicate exact that's water there. Actually, you're right. I could just see there's a channel in the mountain straight ahead and a line leading right to it. Do you see that? I like Victoria's water theory a lot. It definitely makes sense of the alien landing strips. But what about the giant hands, the elegant hummingbirds, and, well, whatever that is? When you make something as big as these, something that can only be seen properly from a bouncy twin-engine Cessna, you're surely trying to communicate with someone or something up here. 2,000 years ago, the only inhabitants up here were the gods. Those clever Nazcans were using land art as a loudspeaker. Long, long before they began doing that, back in ancient Britain, we were doing it too. There are few places on Earth that have had as much nonsense written about them as this one. Depending on who you read, Stonehenge could be an ancient observatory, or the first planetarium, or even an astronomical supercomputer. According to the Arthurian legends, it was built by Merlin, who transported the giant stones from Ireland using his magic. More recently, this excellent lot, the Druids, have claimed that it's one of their ancient temples. But they've only been saying that for a few hundred years, and the stones have been here for thousands. My own view is that Stonehenge celebrates the momentous union of the sky and the earth. And that the handiest way to imagine it is as a giant stone vagina. Here's how it worked. Prehistoric man believed that the earth and the sky were ruled by two powerful gods, the Earth Mother down here and the Sky Father up there. And these two powerful gods were responsible for everything. And once a year, round about now, 
at the longest day, the summer solstice, and only at the summer solstice, the sky guard's sunbeams were at exactly the right angle to penetrate to the centre of the stones and to bring warmth and fertility to the earth. It's not happening today, it's a bit too cloudy, but if the sun was rising strongly enough in the east, then this stone here, the famous heel stone, would be casting a long phallic shadow right down the middle of Stonehenge. And we'd all be watching a cosmic coupling. So that's the idea I go with, the vagina interpretation. What's unarguable is that whatever's being commemorated or worshipped here is being done with sculpture. Someone has dragged these huge rocks into this field, shaped them, cut them, put one on top of the other, and created this mighty circle. But I've got another reason for bringing you here. I wanted to draw your attention to one of the key pleasures of sculpture. I'm not going to explain it fully, because I can't. But I can feel it, right now, right here, at Stonehenge. It's the exciting presence of a great big lump of stuff. The attraction of the blob. Now I suppose it's inherited from rock formations and termite mounds or something like that. And you feel it when you're standing next to a great big raw tottering pile of something that's much, much, much bigger than you. Plenty of good sculptors have gone in search of this feeling through the ages. And even if I can't name it, I can certainly show you some examples. Stonehenge has got me thinking about the impact of the sun and the stars on land art. Which, to cut a long story short, is how I've ended up in a desert in America, completely lost. God, but this country's big. We've been driving around Utah for hours and hours looking for another of these iconic pieces of American land art. It's out there somewhere. For all I know, we could be right in the middle of it, but we're not going to find out till morning. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to it. Sun Tunnels by Nancy Holt. You know what, the stars up there, it's unbelievable. It's so magic looking up at the sky here. I brought my deep sky chart, which I'm studying because although this piece we're gonna to see tomorrow, the sun tunnels, there's a thing in it about the stars as well. So what I need to do tonight to get ready for it is to identify four constellations. I need to find Capricorn, Perseus, Columba, and Draco. So I've been looking up there and beginning to get an idea of it all. Perseus, Columba, Capricorn, and Draco. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I got it there. Perseus.
sunrise, she bringing the morning sunrise. Bring in the we did well. Got up this morning, you could see them about a mile away on the horizon. The sun tunnels. What's more, you can see why they're called the sun tunnels. Because the sun is just coming up now. Magic. Sunrise, she bringing the morning. Sunrise, bringing the morning. Fluttering the skirts all around. Two things I wasn't expecting. One, the colour. You see these in the daytime, and they look like inert slabs of concrete, kind of stuff you see by the side of a motorway. But actually, they really fit the colours. The desert, this clay soil stuff. And when something falls on it, some colour, look at that. You can see the reds inside that tunnel. And then all around us, there are these beautiful fields of ochre and yellow and brown and khaki. Hundreds of different colours. It's just gorgeous. And the other thing, apart from me prattling on, there's no sound. Listen to that. The sound of the sun tunnels. Sunrise, oh, spreading all the light all around. The thing about land art is that it isn't just about the bits in the middle, the stuff that Nancy Holt made and put down here in the desert. What land art does is it brings everything else into play. Now you stand here, and the mountains over there, this big horizon around here. The sun, all of it seems to take on an extra significance. So the actual piece, these four concrete tunnels lying in the middle of the desert, that's just like the final piece of a jigsaw. You put that in and all of it's complete. Nancy Holt was Robert Smithson's wife. She made this in 1973. She came down one day into the desert, was wandering about here, and was overwhelmed, she said, by the feeling of the sun. She said, if you come from a city, you don't really see the sun, but when you come out into the desert, the sun becomes everything. So she came up with this piece, which for her was a way of framing enfranchising the sun in the middle of the desert. And what she did, she took these four concrete tunnels. They're huge and nine foot tall and arranged them in the desert along the two lines of the winter solstice and the summer solstice. So this set of tunnels here is aligned with the summer solstice that set of tunnels there is aligned with the winter solstice. We're not here on the perfect day. If we were here on the summer solstice, you would see the sun coming up right in the middle of the second tunnel, which I'm sure is really dramatic. So that's this, that's just here, Perseus. Named, of course, after a great Greek hero who slayed Medusa, the one with all the snake heads, and who rescued Andromeda from the dragon. So the way this works is that when the sun comes over the tunnels, each of these beams throws a circle of light onto the ground. So what you'll be doing when the sun is right up there in the sky is literally walking over the stars. They'll be on the ground, and you'll be walking over them. Delightful idea. And Nancy Holt, when she was planning this, 
She got a team of astronomers at work here. And all this is actually absolutely to the centimetre. It's all perfectly aligned. One of the things I really like about land art is that it's always about these big subjects. The cosmos, the summer solstice, the sun, the stars. Big ideas. So much more than art is about cheap ideas. You know, it's about movies, it's about celebrity, it's about what's on TV, it's about what it's like to go shopping. Interesting, relevant ideas, but cheap ideas, small ideas. Land art, it's impossible to make land art about celebrities and TV and going shopping. If you're making land art, you have to make art about this, about the big ideas. So, of course, it's no coincidence that most of the really good land artists are Americans. To make land art, you need all this. Yes, you're right. An idiot on a train is trying to sing when he can't. But that's because I'm so excited. Sometime in July 1911, an American explorer called Hiram Bingham climbed up a very steep hill in central Peru, and he discovered a lost city of the Incas. It was called Machu Picchu. At that time, no one had heard of it. No one went there. But now, they've all heard of it, and they all want to go there, including me. I'm here for very obvious reasons. I want to see the landscape being adapted and changed by man. Man at his most skillful and dogged. And that means examining the handiwork of the Incas. Where you or I build things on the ground, the Inca built them in the clouds. The thing about Machu Picchu, the reason why I turn to jelly up here with pleasure, is that the whole place makes no sense. Why do all this all the way up here? We're not on any strategic route between anywhere and anywhere else. It's a terrible place to grow things, an unimaginable place to build things. The effort that went into creating that is scary. So why do it? The answer hits you as soon as you open your eyes up here. Whichever way you look, in whichever direction, all you see are mountains. Mountains, mountains, everywhere. The Inca were mountain worshippers. They believed the mountains were sacred, the source of all life. And up here, in Machu Picchu, they were as close to those mountain gods as they dared to go. So close, they could almost touch them. These days, Machu Picchu has become a famous centre for New Agers and space cadets of all sorts. They particularly like this mountain-shaped rock, which was put here especially by the Inca, to mimic and represent the mountains behind. It's a sacred rock, you have to touch it. And there's another one there. There's another one there. This one here, it's the most famous sculpture in Machu Picchu. It's right at the top of the highest hill. All sorts of people have all sorts of theories about what it represents. 
popular theory is that it's some kind of sundial. Others say that it's specially aligned to the various solstices. But I go with the latest theory, which is that like the other mountain-shaped rocks we've seen, it's actually an abstract representation of the mountains behind it. And if you get the alignment right, get the sun in the right place, you'll see that the shapes, the ridge along there, and the big peak in the middle, match up. Oh yes, the Inca loved their mountains. They carved them, cut them, shaped them. But their greatest sculptural achievement, the one for which they will always be remembered, is their walls. No mortar, no cement, just carefully, perfectly fitted blocks of individually hand-carved stone. Each one a sculpture in itself that's been carefully shaped and then fitted together like a jigsaw. This effect here, that's called pillow carving. It makes the stone look as if it's been inflated with air from the inside. And this puffy look makes the wall seem somehow weightless. Look at this. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten sides. Ten sided stone. This one stone here weighs over 250 tons. How did they get it here? How did they do any of this? Well, it's a remarkable process. If you or I we're building a big stone wall. We'd carve the individual bits of stone and pile them up one on top of the other. But that's not how the Inca did it. The Inca chose each stone for each position. And having carved the one underneath, they would lower the one on top backwards and forwards, down and up, down and up, onto the stone below. And every time, they would see what needed doing. Did they need to carve a bit here? Did they need to add a bit there? Until eventually, it all slotted together like this perfect jigsaw. It's a remarkable process, and it's worked because these walls have survived the earthquakes of Peru, which are about as big as earthquakes come. I salute the Inca's walls. They're exquisite bits of sculpture. And look how many sculptors who came afterwards have tried to match them. Even the minimalists have had a go. But I see we've drifted off the topic of mountains. And that's wrong. If you're investigating land art, you mustn't forget the mountains. Most places you go in America, the Wild West has clearly finished. But in Arizona, I'm not sure that the news has got through yet. And there's two things that everybody should come to Arizona for. One, the Grand Canyon, of course. Everybody's heard of that. 
But the second thing you may not have heard of, Roden Crater. Remember that name. It's the largest work of art in the world. If you look through the windscreen over there, you should just see a great big volcano on the horizon. That's Roden Crater. An artist called James Terrell bought that volcano about 30 years ago. He loved it, it's a beautiful thing, but it wasn't quite right for him. So he spent the past 30 years working on it, reshaping it, making it more perfect, and filling it with secret chambers. It hasn't been opened yet. It's not due to open until 2012, but we're getting a sneak preview. James, we're standing right on the rim of the volcano here, and you get a fantastic sense of why this landscape must have appealed to you when you first saw it. Can you talk us back through those early days? Well, I really wanted to find this space that was a bowl-shaped space held up above the surrounding plain. I had, in 74, begun looking, and I flew all the western states, basically from the Rockies to the Pacific and all the way down into Mexico and to Chihuahua. I was looking for a space that had its own power, this was my favorite. I saw it in a November day, at the, at the end of the day, uh, uh, so that the sun was strongly on the western side of it. And it just looked fantastic as I saw it come into view. I was flying on the north side of the peaks here, coming in an east-west uh, direction. And so I landed out down below and then spent the night here at the crater, and then went in to see the ownership and what the story was. It wasn't for sale. He said he bought land. He didn't sell it. <laughs> but I went and saw him every Friday for three years when he paid his cowboys. And so I got a lease on it in, uh, I guess, 76. I've just moved uh, 1.4 million cubic yards, and it hardly looks like I've done anything. Welcome to Jim's world. <laughs> wow. This is the sun and moon space here, where actually this side is the sun, the furthest north sunrise. The opposite side is the moon, the furthest south moon set. So it's north sunrise and south moon set. So the white disc that's in the middle of the stone here will be like a, like a movie projection screen almost. And, and, and on it, we'll be able to see the, 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 the sun rising, and, and on the other side, we'll see the moon. Yes, yes. So when you come here, those are the kinds of things you'll, you will experience. Well, this is essentially like a giant pinhole camera here, isn't it? Yes, it's actually like a giant telescope. These are gestures to events that do come, but come regularly. What you'll see is spaces that are set up for certain events, awaiting them, but it's also possible to make things that won't be experienced in my lifetime, but I know where they'll happen. How deep down in the volcano are we? We're 120 feet underneath the top of the crater. So we're heading up to what looks like, like a giant um, keyhole. Yes, that it is. And now, what was the circle becomes an ellipse. Ah. So if you stare up, you can just see the circle stretching. Strange feeling. Ah. For animation. It's quite wonderful. Uh, 
artists and architects are making all these structures and things that we inhabit to have these feelings, to have a sense of awe than anything that's said or read in them. So this has always been the territory of art. We have this relationship to the cosmos. It affects us physically as the tides do and planting cycles, as well as uh, the cycle of women and fertility. I mean, it's quite amazing, and yet we have lost some of that understanding. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, we know it, but we don't really feel it that well. This chamber down here is called the East Portal, and I think it's the most spectacular of all the chambers in the volcano. You come out of a dark tunnel, and there in front of you is this golden staircase leading right up to the sky. And when you come up the golden staircase, you look around and you find you come out right in the middle of the volcano's bowl. And what I also like is when you look back down again, there's a blue circle in the ground that looks exactly like the Earth, as the Earth must have looked when Neil Armstrong looked back down on it from the moon. It's a kind of God's eye view of the Earth. You know, part of this is to take something awesome, this idea of coming to grips with the whole the whole sky, the entire cosmos, and yet have it feel somewhat personal, that it's a space that's for you. you know, we are a part of nature, and one of our greatest conceits is to feel apart from it. We have this great hubris to think that we own a piece of the earth when we buy it and have these certificates of, of sale and ownership and all that, but that's sort of like a fly thinking it owns the banana it lights on. flies on a banana. I suppose that does sound like us. But at least sculpture gives us a shot at eternity. Long after we're gone, our land art will still be there. There are a million stories in the world of sculpture. This has been a few of them.